meetings. Uh, we have Frank Luco. How many people here know who Frank Luco is? He is awesome. I mean, we are so fortunate to have Chris Ann here today. You're going to just fall out of your chair. And then Frank Luco is going to be here. He's on the other side. He's on right now uh, on Sundays. He does the show. Uh, he's a security expert. And the guy is a dynamic speaker. And he's going to be uh, a special event on March 19th. Not here. It's going to get to the Nels Park Auditorium a couple blocks from here. Then next month we have Governor Gone Wild with Blaze Iglesio. I can't read. Ingola. Thank you. Ingola. I, I have a terrible time remembering his name. He is so dynamic. And then I want to end, and you'll like this, Chris. Uh, I want to end by saying that we have the Constitution study starting at Mickey's uh, Clubhouse. You all know that we've been studying the Federalist Papers all through last year. Uh, and, and, and that was like waiting in deep water, wasn't it? <laughs> Tom, they stepped through and it was like deep water. Um, we're going to do the Constitution study starts on February 28th at 7 o'clock. So um, this will be like gliding after going through the Federalist Papers. So with that, I want to bring on Chris Ann Hall. And Chris Ann is a former prosecutor and constitutional attorney. Uh, she was fired after teaching the Constitution to Tea Party groups. She sued and recently won her suit on First Amendment rights. Uh, she is a deaf veteran of the U.S. Army, a Russian linguist, a mother, a pastor's wife, and a patriot. She now travels the country and teaches the Constitution and the history that gave us our founding documents. Uh, she was awarded the Freedom Fighter Award by Americans for Prosperity and the Certificate of Achievement from the Sons of the Revolution for her defense of constitutional principles. So with that, I'll bring Chris Ann on. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to come. I'm going to put this over here. And I don't like podiums because I'm short. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set that over here so that I can use it. But then you don't have to try to look over it to see me. We, um, how many of you agree with me that we live in the greatest nation on the planet? And in spite of what Justice Ginsburg and her crew might say, uh, our Constitution is a very old document. Uh, but it is that old and still working because it is that good. And uh, I don't know about Ms. Ginsburg, she should be a little bit more careful about throwing things out when they get old. I really want to take you on a little historical journey uh, so you can see how we got the greatest constitution that this world has ever known, the greatest human rights statements that this world has ever known. And you know, uh, you heard that I'm a veteran, I'm an attorney. Uh, I took an oath, the same oath, three times to support and defend the constitution and to pledge my faith and allegiance same voluntarily, uh, without reservation, the same oath that Ms. Ginsburg took. But you know, we take an oath all the time. You guys just took an oath a few minutes ago. It's called the Pledge of Allegiance. That is an oath. And I think one of the most unfortunate things that we have going for us now is that we take an oath that we don't really understand. And to take an oath in which you don't fully understand is like taking no oath at all. Because you, you pledge allegiance to a flag and to the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's a very, very specific language in there, purposefully placed we don't say with, with freedom and justice for all. We don't say we pledge allegiance to our democracy. We don't even say we pledge allegiance to our constitutional democracy. We say we pledge allegiance to our republic. And part of what we are suffering from today
today they in our judicial what system, they were shooting in for our was a focus on liberty, and American they gave us right? the best documents they could give us to protect us. From what? Ourselves. How many of you have heard that those who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it? <coughs> There, that is a very accurate statement with one slight inaccuracy. And I hope you'll see this as we move along. We will always repeat history because there is nothing new under the sun. And human nature never changes. What our founding fathers were doing were looking at the history to help us protect us from repeating the mistakes in history. Patrick Henry has said, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is a lamp of experience. I know no way to judge the future but by the past. Alexander Hamilton said, where, the or where experience is the oracle of truth, and where its responses are unequivocal, they ought to be held to be sacred. Myth number two, our founding fathers, number one, we're not winging it, not, and, they didn't, and they knew exactly what they were doing. Myth number two, they were not engaged in some mystical experiment. They didn't go see some medium or have some crystal ball or have some grand future-telling powers. They knew their history, so they knew our future. So what is their history that has given us this great document? We can start in 1041 England, because in 1041 England, England has already the most compl complex form of government known to man. It's not great. It's nothing like we have now. But in 1041, the king has made an arrangement with his barons and lords to meet with the people of the shires, which are like our counties, and meet with them twice a year in a, in a pre-designated place so that the people of the shires can say to the barons and lords what they're happy about and what they're unhappy about. The, the, the principle then is the barons and the lords go to the king and explain to the king what the people like, and then the king, you know, pretty much does what he pleases. Because he's king. The thing is, though, the people were beginning to understand <coughs> that that they enjoyed being part of their government, that they, had a, that they should have a part in their government. They were awakening this understanding of an inherent possession of liberty. Well, in 1066, this king dies, and he dies without an heir, which is a bad thing. But he tries to appoint Harold to be his second in charge, to be the king of England, because he likes Harold, and the people of England like Harold. But you understand, kings are not elected or appointed, are they? They are there by divine right, by blood, by birth. And just because the king did not have a direct heir didn't mean that he didn't have a relative somewhere that wanted to be king. And he did. His name was William I of Normandy. You see, William I was also known as William the Conqueror. And that's exactly what he did. He took his Norman army over to England and conquered Harold and the English people and set himself up on the throne. So what do you suppose now we have this new king? What do you think the first thing that he did? He started corrupting their judicial system with judges that were loyal to him. He started trying to replace their English common law with his foreign Norman law. He starts chasing... <coughs>
four sons. Well, I actually had three. The first one was killed in a hunting accident. So he is meeting with his secondborn just about on his deathbed, and he and his secondborn get into a fight. I think it was about over the king governing the country. And his secondborn leaves, runs away, and fights in the Crusades, leaving two sons, William II and Henry I. So now we have two heirs to the throne. William II is up first, Henry I is up second. And William and Henry go hunting. <laughs> and William II is killed in a mysterious hunting accident. Now, the people of England reacted just like you did. So there was a grand tribunal called a great government investigation, sort of, you know, congressional inquiry, if you were, found that Henry was not at fault. But think about this, though, logically, if they had found Henry at fault, wouldn't they be at the same place they were in 1066 with no heir to the throne and right for the conqueror again? They had no choice. But Henry was not getting the support of the people, so he had to make two concessions. He married an Anglo-Saxon woman, which gave them representation on the throne as a huge part of the British Empire at this time. And the second thing that he did is why I told you this history. The most important thing for us is that he signed the 1100 Charter of Liberties, a promise in writing with the seal of the king that the king would no longer be evil and oppressive. Listen, I, Henry, by the grace of God, having been crowned king of England, I think that's Henry's way of saying thank you, God, for stray arrows. <laughs> will end all evil practices that have been an oppressive presence in England. Listen to what was evil and oppressive in 1100 England. If any, of my, any, if any baron or earl of mine shall die, his heir shall not be forced to purchase their inheritance, but shall retrieve it through force of law and custom. In 1100 England, inheritance tax was evil and oppressive. Isn't that what that is when you have to buy your inheritance from the IRS? That's what we do every year. If any of my baron commit a crime, he shall not bind himself to the crown for the payment as was done in the time of my father and brother, but shall stand for the crime as was custom in law and make amends as are appropriate. In 1100 England, it was considered evil and oppressive for the men who made the laws to consider themselves above the law. Don't you wish Eric Holder had a little piece of that? Yeah. I watched those fast and furious hearings, almost nine years of prosecutorial experience. I can tell you that if they had that evidence against me, I would not be getting a finger wagging from Daryl Issa. I'd be under a federal prison. Right. So it puzzles me why even today Congress is sitting around wringing their hands. Oh, what do we do about Holder? Oh, what do we do about Holder? The answer is simply right in front of them. You indict him. Yes. Well, before we think we were better off in 1100 England than we are today, rest assured that Henry didn't believe a word he was doing, and he, he was saying, he only signed it to appease the people. But the thing was, he could never, ever get away from the promise that was made, and no king after him could either. So when John, the most evil king that, that England has ever known, takes the throne, the people of England today said that hell was fouled by the presence of John. Not because he was the king that started income tax, because he was, but the fact that he was absolutely, violently ruthless with his tax collection. If the people could not, because he taxed them to death, literally, if they could not pay, imprisonment, mutilation, execution, he was absolutely ruthless. How many of you have heard of Robin Hood? Yeah. Meet King John. Tell me, what's Robin Hood's claim to fame? Robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. I want to show you this little illustration really quickly so you see how far back, how deep our socialist indoctrination is. Robin Hood was not engaged in a grand utopian socialist experiment of redistribution of wealth, like we have been taught. 
Robin Hood was taking and stealing money from the crown from King John and returning it to the people so that they could literally live to see another day. I have proof. It's in Disney. <laughs> really. Honestly. Have you seen the Disney version of Robin Hood? The fox is Robin Hood and the king is a lion. Okay, if you've seen it, go back and look at it with a new set of eyes, with your new historically accurate eyes. If you haven't, go watch it. What you'll see is the king saying, taxes, taxes, glorious taxes, bleed them dry with beautiful taxes. And you will see Robin Hood, the little fox and his bear friend, running around, only taking from the crown and his constable, returning it to the people so that the constable could literally come and take the taxes one more time. That's how deep this goes. Well, see, Stephen, um, I'm sorry, John had engaged in this taxation, and I really believe that he probably could have oppressed the people for quite a bit longer, and he did the one thing that broke the stamp camel on the straw's back. He interfered with the business of the church. You see, the people had chosen Stephen Langton as their, their archbishop. And John said, no, I don't recognize your choice. I'm simply not going to allow him to be. So here you have the government telling the church how to run their business. Imagine that. Nobody would think that would happen, would it? And so Stephen Langton and the barons and the lords, they organize together, they get the people together, and they start a revolution against John. And in this revolution, 25 men got together and created a document called the Magna Carta. Many of your historians will start your educational, your constitutional education with the Magna Carta, and I think they do you a great disservice. Because you would not have a Magna Carta without the 1100 Charter of Liberties. Because the 1100 Charter of Liberties, our battle for liberty began with a promise not to be evil and oppressive. And here we have John breaking that promise. And the people of England coming together and saying, hey, through the crown you've promised me you will not be evil and oppressive. And since you obviously don't know how to do that, we are writing the Magna Carta, which will give you specific guidelines on what you can and cannot do so that you will not be evil and oppressive. That was the purpose of the Magna Carta, a, se a series of guidelines to instruct the king on how to operate under the laws of liberty. Clause 14 said that there'd be no taxation without representation. But what representation did they have? Well, see, the Magna Carta created a committee of 25 common-born men who could tell the king no. Think about that. A man established by birth by divine right having common-born men telling him no. You know that didn't go over very well. Let me also tell you that uh, Clause uh, 39 and 40 were actually our five, fifth, sixth, and seventh amendment rights to habeas corpus and jury trial rooted all the way back to 1215 England. And so, John signs the Magna Carta because he's got a sword in his throat, not because he believes it. But now they have the seed to representative government. Now the people of England are really still starting to feel out this liberty thing and, and what it means to have it and what it means to keep it. And so what we need to do for brevity's sake is sort of fast forward now to 1628. Charles I is on the throne, and he's going the way of John and Henry and, and William I uh, before him. Jo only Charles is, is a little bit more blatant about it. He's romping around Europe. Okay. He's romping around Europe, increasing great debt for the people of England. Just what they said on a whim. Every whim Charles had, he went after just throwing money all over the place. And how do kings pay for debt? Taxes. Well, now he has to answer to 25 common poor men, does he not? Well, he's supposed to anyway, right? So when they got tired of passing Charles's laws to pay for his whims and started telling him no, what do you suppose Charles did? He sent them home. 
okay, if you won't run the government the way I think it needs to be run, we don't need you. Go home. We'll do it without you. And so he had, the people would rise up and the parliament would come back and he would do it again. He did it one more time. The people had had enough and they started a revolution against Charles. This time, they drafted a document called the Petition of Right of 1628. Now, remember, the 1100 Charter of Liberties is a promise <coughs> not to be evil and oppressive. The Magna Carta is its guideline on how not to be evil and oppressive. Well, the 11, uh, I'm sorry, the Charter of the Petition of Right of 1628 is a list of grievances on how the king has violated these guidelines. They're saying, you've broken this clause, you've broken this clause, you've broken this clause. We have the right to this, 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 and this. And this, and this, and this, and this is what you're doing in violation of those rights. It says, we have a right to habeas corpus. You cannot quarter troops. You cannot have martial law in time of peace. And yes, we still have the right to habeas corpus. You cannot tax us without representation. There's a very subtle thing that happens in the 1628 Petition of Right that I think many people looked over, and I think Charles looked over it himself. But it's really in the, in the last part of the preamble, which says that liberty is an inherent possession of man and not something that the government is responsible for giving the people. See, the people were understanding that liberty belongs to them. You've all had that understanding. I bet you didn't even realize it. Because when you, there's, you're sitting here today, open-eyed, and you're getting educated, but I believe that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, not too long ago, or maybe long ago, because some of you have, might have been aware of what's going on for a long time, there was at least one point where you said, you know what, something is wrong. Am I right? Something is wrong. Maybe you can't put your finger on it, but something is wrong. In my humble opinion, I believe that is the proof that liberty is here. Someone did not have to come and tell you your spirit of liberty in you explained to you, warning bell, something's going wrong. Time to wake up the master of the house. It's time to figure out what we're doing here. Something is wrong. And that's what was, what was going on with the people in 1628. Well, Charles I signs the Petition of Right, just like John did with a sword at his throat. So he didn't believe any of it. Problem is, the people are getting it. And when Charles went back to business as usual, the people did not tolerate it. You see, Charles went still about spending all his money and wanting to increase the taxes. And the Parliament said no. So he sent them home again. And then he realized, I guess learning from having a sword at his throat, that because Parliament's not there, he cannot pass a law that creates taxes. <laughs> so he didn't. He passed a law that created forced loans. He called them forced loans, not taxes. Therefore, he didn't need Parliament to pass a law like that. When eight knights refused to pay their forced loans, they were arrested and imprisoned and held without trial. When they petitioned the court for their right to habeas corpus and they were brought before the judge, it went something like this. Well, these men are before us. They have petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus. They petitioned for the right to trial. But I see that there are no formal charges against them. What are we to do? The judge and continued by saying, Well, since they have no formal charges against them, we must believe that the crimes that they've committed are so violent and so heinous that the, that the general public cannot be informed of their crimes. And therefore, because their crimes are so heinous, they do not deserve their day in court. 
these many of them died in prison from sickness and illness because you know what prison back then wasn't like our little socialist system now and that brought a new revolution the people took Charles into custody and tried him this time for a new list of grievances called the Grand Remonstrance of 1641. The Grand Remonstrance was a new list of six of grievances that said how Charles had broken the promise in 1100 and violated the guidelines of 1215. How many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of sustainable development? Agenda 21? Would you be surprised to know that the UN didn't invent that? Some of the indictments against Charles were for sustainable development. He was taking, forcibly taking the private lands from the private landowners and creating national forests in the name of conservation and preservation. And then arresting and finding and mutilating and executing anyone found hunting on those lands. He was taking the private land to make sewer districts, environmental protection perhaps. And then he was trying to remove them from the gold and silver standard, placing them on brass fiat coins so that he could control the value of their currency instead of the, the real value in the gold and silver. Well, the people did not take a sword to Charles this time. They arrested him, indicted him, and found him guilty of these crimes. And the interesting thing about this indictment were some of the final words that Charles said. And just paraphrasing one part, he said, you know, I don't understand this liberty that the people want. I could have provided them with better liberty than they ever would have achieved on their own. Remember, he signed a document in 1628 acknowledging that liberty was an inherent possession of man. And he never got it, and he never believed it and he lost his head over it. So, listen to what this grand remonstrance of 1641 says because this, this preamble is very, very important. The root of all this mischief we find to be a malignant and pernicious design of subverting the fundamental laws and principles of government upon which the religion and justice of this kingdom are firmly established. Now as a linguist, as an attorney, uh, words are my art. And, and I read sometimes and they become animated. They're popping out of me. This, this paragraph is like popcorn. Just blasting me. So rich. So what I want to do is I want to take, because I, I believe we, we put down our dictionaries too much sometimes. That My dictionary is probably one of my most, my second most used resources. And I looked up that word subvert because we don't use that word too much anymore. And I found out that word subvert means to overturn or undermine. So what they're saying is they have found a malignant and pernicious design used to overturn the fundamental principles of liberty. The people are having awakening saying, hey, wait a minute here. There's a pattern over these last 600 years. We're seeing tyrants use tyrannical tools, the same ones over and over again. Taxation, property rights, the monetary system, religious liberty, court systems, disarming the people. The same thing over and over again. It's a malignant and pernicious design to overturn and undermine liberty. But think about that though. They said the liberty that has been firmly established. And my first thought when I'm doing this research and writing this seminar is firmly established. How do they have anything firmly established in 1641, right? They all live in grass huts and mud houses and stuff, you know? They don't have CNN or MSNBC or Fox to tell them what's going on. They don't have Beck or Hannity or Rush to tell them when the king's going nuts. <laughs> How do they know? How is this stuff firmly established? And you know what happened before I could even answer that question? Conviction. Conviction 
set in on me because I haven't been involved in this in this very long. I'm a recovering liberal. <laughs>
two anymore, but John, George Washington wrote this letter, and I'll paraphrase for you, but he basically said, you know, we've been petitioning for 10 years now. We've got to do something. We're starting to look like a bunch of mamby-pamby wimps, and I'm sick of it. It is time for action. You see, our founding fathers did not have to invent the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence because they brought it with them through history. You see, the glorious revolution of 1688 was with King James II, who was going the way of Charles, going the way of John, going the way of Henry and William I, and just going nuts. You see, everything was okay for England while James was married to his first wife. But his first wife died, leaving three daughters, and you can't give a crown to a daughter at this time. So you always have to have an opportunity to have a son. So how do kings have sons? They remarry. And who do kings remarry? They marry princesses from other nations to garner allegiances and strength of the kingdom. I mean, we've all seen those movies. We know how that works. James marries an Italian princess. Now, this is unpleasant history. I'm not making any remark against any segment of the population whatsoever. These are just the facts of history, so don't take me for more than what I'm telling you. He marries an Italian princess. The problem with this historical scenario is the Pope is acting not like an ecclesiastical leader, but is literally the general of the Roman army. He comes over with Miss Princess to England and tries to make England into Rome. Starts replacing the judges with judges that were loyal to his crown. Loyal to sub, sub, uh, overturning the English common law and replacing it with Roman law. He starts placing his bishops in the Protestant churches of England to change them into Catholicism and collect taxes through the church and tell them how they are to conduct their worship services. He starts removing the private land, once again, from the landowners and trying to replace it with his foreign friends. And how do you do that now? Don't, you, don't, dis don't you disarm. Sorry. You disarm the people. So five ministers petitioned the king because they had the right to petition the king of their grievances, and said to the king, Sir, we are Protestant. We are not Catholic. Please do not con forcibly convert us. We are English. We have our own common law. Please do not force foreign law on us. And so what do you suppose the king did? He arrested them prosecuted them, and executed them. And then he passed a law called seditious libel that said if you disagree with the king, it is punishable by death. And oh yeah, that Magna Carta thing, by the way, you'll get your trial. But a provision of this law said that truth is no defense. So even if you're right, you're wrong because you cannot disagree with the king. And then we have the glorious revolution of 1688 in which the people of England draw a new list of grievances. A new list of how James II has violated his promise in the 1100 Charter of Liberty and broken the law of the Magna Carta called the Bill of Rights of 1689. And that was the document that our founding fathers carried from England to the United States that woke them up when George started going the way of James and Charles and John and Henry and William. You see, ben Thomas Jefferson did not invent the Declaration of Independence. He literally plagiarized it from the Bill of Rights of 1689 which was copied after the, uh, of the Grand Remonstrance and the Petition of Rights. And you see, they didn't have to invent it. They inherited it. And 
And that's why it's not a living document. That's the reason, part of the reason, other than the legal reasons, why you have to know what they were going through when they wrote it in order to properly interpret it. And their warnings to us are crying out over and over and over again saying, hey, when we wrote this, we had that lamp of experience. We were trying to protect you from repeating the mistakes that we made and that our fathers made. Listen to this, this document of the Bill of Rights of 1689 as, as we close out this section. Whereas the late King James II, by the assistance of evil counselors, judges, and ministers employed by him, you realize kings can't be tyrants as one man, right? They have to have judges and counselors and ministers and czars and regulatory agencies <laughs> to carry out their power, right? Did endeavor to subvert. We know that word, right? Overturn and undermine. But they didn't leave it there. They said, and extirpate. You see, they wanted to make sure it was perfectly clear what James was doing. And that word extirpate means to completely destroy. Is there anything left when you completely destroy something? Did endeavor to subvert and extirpate the Protestant religion and the laws and liberties of this kingdom. Now, I'm just, I'm just going to read to you one thing. By assuming and exercising the power of dispensing with and suspending laws and the execution of laws without the consent of Parliament. The executive branch, writing laws, overturning laws, setting aside laws, when they don't have, when he didn't have the power to do that, that belonged to Parliament, the legislative branch, in 1689, was an attempt to completely destroy liberty. Executive orders, cap and trade, amnesty, <coughs> gun laws, regulatory agencies, Department of Justice simply choosing which laws they'll, over, they'll follow and which ones they'll enforce. See, we don't talk about completely destroying liberty today. We get mad, we throw things at the TV, we yell and scream. But I, I got this sneaking suspicion that they use that word extirpate because they were really beyond that point. They had gotten to the awakening point. We're just awakening in the process. You see, most of us uh, have, have gotten to the point where we've been taxed enough already, right? There's, there's another step that we have to take, though, ladies and gentlemen. You see, we do not trust Congress with our pocketbook, do we? You trust them with your pocketbook? Then we've got to get to the point where we no longer trust them with our liberty either. When we are willing to protect our liberty, like we protect our pocketbooks, then we will come to the point where we can talk about liberty being completely destroyed. James was taking the guns away from the people. James had administrative laws that were circumventing the common law of England, like the courts that you have to go through if you're with the EPA. I saw on Fox last night a story about a woman and a man who had had their land taken from them. There was a drainage ditch where they were living was clogged. And they called the government and said, please come clear this drainage uh, ditch. And they said, we are six months behind. Why don't you do it if you can? So he said, okay, and he took a backhoe and cleared the drainage ditch, which allowed the water runoff to go, and he was arrested on federal charges for cleaning out the drainage ditch. He took it to jury trial, and the jury acquitted him, found him not guilty. 
Two months later, he got a letter from the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers saying, well, isn't it beautiful that the jury acquitted you? Well, we think they were wrong. And so since we think they were wrong, and we know your land to be a wetland, it wasn't, it was only a wetland because the drainage was clogged, they dug 88 feet deep and never found the water table when they were trying to dig a well, You have to get off your property or we are going to charge you and fine you $37,000 a day. Completely ignoring the law of the land and creating their own. And James was accused of attempting to completely destroy liberty. Well, what has happened to us? How many of you are parents? Grandparents count, because you had to have children. <laughs> so how many of you engage in Christmas gift giving with your child? So that means you've probably been subject to the pre-Christmas list, right? That list of stuff that your kid goes through, the you know, commercials or TV with us, it was like the JCPenney catalogs and the Sears and all that, of the stuff that they have to have or they're just going to die, right? Because every other child on the planet has one, and if your kid doesn't get one, their friends won't be friends with them anymore. They'll be ostracized. They'll be outcasts. They'll grow up warped adults. You'll have warped grandchildren. It'll be all your fault, right? I mean, that's the drama that they play for us. So even when times are hard, we do what we can. We get our kids the one thing that they need that makes them happy, right? And there it is, Christmas Day, the paper's flying, and there it is, the one thing that they had to have, and now you're the greatest person on the planet. But where is that gift two weeks later? In the trash. Well, probably in the closet, under a bed, in a drawer, somewhere. Where is it all? I know where it is, it's in my room somewhere. Well see, I said two weeks, because I think two weeks after Christmas, you can probably sell that gift for what you bought it for on eBay. <laughs> So if we establish that the monetary value of that gift has not changed, what has changed to bring it from being the most important thing in your child's life to being, oh, well, it's in the, the room somewhere. I know where it is. The value that they place in it, right? Well, didn't we start off this presentation by establishing that uh, at least that liberty was a gift from God? Do you think the value of liberty has changed in the eyes of God? Didn't we also say that liberty was a gift purchased for us by the blood of the men and women who secured it for us? Yes. Do you think the value of liberty has changed in the eyes of those men and women who died so we could have it today? Mm -hmm. What has changed? The value we put in it. Yeah. Oh, I know that liberty thing. It's in the Constitution. It's in the Bill of Rights. I know where it is. If I need it, I can find it. But see, Fred Lewis, who's on our Supreme Court, took a poll and asked people to name all five protections in the First Amendment. Because there are five distinct protections in the First Amendment. He found out that only 2% of the people could name all five. See, how do you know your liberty is not already gone if you don't even know what it is? We become lazy in our luxuries. We become pacified in our prosperity. And only when we reacquaint ourselves with the history that will fortify an attachment to our Constitution and an understanding of the value of liberty that requires sacrifice will we then be prepared to do what we have to do to protect liberty for our children. See, I believe we are at the point of this generation. It is now our turn to pledge life, fortune, and sacred honor for the very same liberty our founding fathers pledged for ages and millions yet unborn. You see, for them, life was picking up the musket. For us, that's not necessarily true. You see, I gave up my life as an attorney to travel this country and teach the truth about the Constitution. Have any of you learned anything here today? 
I put over 6,000 miles a month on my car when I'm not flying to where I'm going. I drag my son around with me. My husband comes with me as much as he can. This is a ministry for us. I never charge a group a fee. I will speak to 400 the same I will speak to eight. Because God taught me a long time ago not to number my people. Because he has his purpose. So listen. All I'm asking you to do, I'm not here to teach you so you can go out and regurgitate. I'm asking you don't leave it here. <coughs> we have got to all be a part of this. We are a body in this. Not everybody can be a hand, not everybody can be a foot, but we all have a role to play in this. And it's our day now to pledge our life, our fortune, our sacred honor for liberty. Daniel Webster said, hold on to the Constitution and to the Republic for which it stands. Miracles do not cluster, and what has happened once in 6,000 years may never happen again. He said, hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. So do you believe that we are the shining city on a hill? That we are the last bastion of hope? If you believe that, then you understand that our sacrifice is worth it. Our America is worth this sacrifice. Our liberty is worth this sacrifice. And if that stuff is still too, too intangible for you, can I share with you my motivation? Is that little boy right over there? Because we were a single income family. Mine. And when I was told that I could speak or I could have a paycheck. It became abundantly clear to me the time we were in. I could realistically look 10 years down the road and watch my son look at me in the face and say, why didn't you stand for my rights when I could not? How could I explain to him that Christmas presents were more important than something like that? You have to find your place in this. You've got to find your place to stand. Because we are at that time, and it is just that important. And our children are worth it. And so, how many of you can think of at least one person you wish was standing with, sitting here today, hearing this? How many of you wish that our state legislators had to go through this kind of educational training? So why don't you demand it? Because you're their boss, right? You should be in charge of the training that they get. Demand it. I have, I have stared straight in the face of at least six House representatives in this state and said, invite me. Give me ten minutes notice. Well, I'd actually need an hour and a half to drive there. And I will drop everything that I'm doing and I will teach you my seminar for free. I will give you all my books because it's just that important. How many of them do you think have taken me up on that? Actually, I was on the radio with Mr. Nugent. And Mr. Nugent said, oh yeah, that's really great, Clissian. Let's make this work. Here's the contact number for my guy and we'll get it done. Guess what happened? <coughs> messages after messages and no return calls. You've got to do this for me, people, because these people, our representatives, our politicians, I only have 1,600 friends on Facebook. I'm not important enough for them. <laughs> By the way, if you're on Facebook, go like my Facebook page so maybe I'll get more important for them. But I need your help. If you have friends or relatives that have groups in other parts of the United States, tell them about me. I will travel and go teach them. Thank you so much for listening to me for so long. You sat and I